This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Philip, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Great to see you, Bob. It's a pleasure. Likewise. So the topic for today is you have a relatively new book that the Mises Institute has in its collection called Full Reserve Banking versus the Real Bills Doctrine, a critique of the monetary theory of J.R. Rallo. And the sub, the, the description they give is Bagus mercilessly dismantles Rallo's proposed alternative theory of money point by point. So a very interesting topic. I guess before we dive into the specifics, what made you write on this? Well, uh, Rayo is quite quite famous here in Spain, and the topic is very important because it's uh, about the question of full reserve banking and fractional reserve banking. So if you let the virus of fractional reserve banking um, multiply itself, it's, it's, it's a danger. So um, I think it's, uh, it's very important to point out that also fractional reserve banking on real bills is problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Not only fractional reserve banking based on mortgages and so on. Okay, yeah. And this, just for the listeners, I know even Mises back in the, what we translate as the theory of money and credit was dealing with people arguing that, oh yeah, in, in general, we understand why uh, the, the commercial banks sort of issuing credit out of thin air, as they say, uh, could, be a, could be distortionary and you know, illusory. But if it's, if it's businesses coming and they want to borrow against you know, real goods that they're putting up, that, you know, that's, that's just the needs of commerce. And we do want banks to be able to facilitate that. So that, you know, I, I know that that, so I can see how that's relevant to the fractional reserve uh, banking debate. And also too, like guys like George Selgin, I don't know off the top of my head, maybe you do, Philip, if he has a position on the real bills doctrine, but it does sound similar to, you know, them claiming he and, and Larry White that, oh, we're not, this isn't artificial, that if the, if the public wants to hold bank notes issued by, you know, the banks, and they're, even if they're fractional reserve, then that's, but by the very act of you holding on to a bank note, you're, you're supplying the savings. Like, that's the kind of way they try to uh, deal with it. So definitely relevant. So, but maybe before we get too much into the weeds, just big picture, what, what is the real bills doctrine? Well, the real bills doctrine defends uh, flexible money supply. So it thinks that if the demand for money increases, if the need for trade increases, then it's beneficial that the banking system increases the supply of money. Yeah, so the demand of money increases, so therefore the banks should increase the supply of money. Yeah, otherwise there would be problem because prices would be rigid and there would be costs also involved because then more gold mines would have to would be opened because the purchasing power of gold would increase and so on. Therefore, to have this monetary equilibrium, and here we come to uh, Selgin and White, who also argue in this direction, it would be beneficial if the banking system increases the money supply. And the Rebuilds Doctrine says furthermore that it isn't irrelevant um, against what the banks create new money yeah so it would be only um okay if the fractional reserve banks create new money against real bills that is short-term commercial papers why because these are backed by real goods that are already produced or very close to being sold to consumers and therefore it would be it would be no problem to, and, and uh, the amount of fiduciary media or the credit that the banking system would give would be limited by these real amounts of goods that are already in existence. So it would be backed. Yeah? They always talk about backing by real savings. And these are the goods uh, already produced and almost sold to consumers. Okay, so just to get, come up with like two different paradigmatic examples a defender of the real bills doctrine might agree and say, oh yeah, we wouldn't want the banks to artificially expand the money supply by giving a, a, a loan to somebody who just wanted to, to borrow 
but like a consumer loan and just go with, you know, unsecured. I'm going to borrow $5,000 because I want to take my family to Disney World and I'll pay the bank back to that money plus 10% interest one year from now. And there's, there's no collateral pledge. It's just a consumer loan. Someone might be agree that yes, the bank creating that five thousand dollars through a big bookkeeping entry might be problematic. But if there's a business that has goods in the warehouse and they just need to pay the workers a month for a month of wages while it takes time to ship the goods from the warehouse to the store and then get the money from the final consumer, and that if if the bank defaults or sorry, if the if the business defaults on that loan, the bank could ultimately take you know, the goods is the collateral. And so the, the, there's, you know, backing, so there's something quote, backing up that money creation. They're going to argue that that's, that's qualitatively different, that, that that's just the banks facilitating genuine commerce, greasing the wheels of trade, if you will. And that, that's different from just the family living beyond its means. Is it, is yeah. it something like that? Is that the distinction they're pushing yes. for? Yes. And it's backed by real savings, they say, because mm. they say these are consumer goods. Yeah, consumer goods that are already produced, and so they are real goods that are backing it. So there's, uh, it's not the credit expansion in this case, according to them, is not unbacked by real mm -hmm. savings, like if a bank creates a mortgage mm -hmm. out of nothing, so a thirty-year loan, uh, where which is backed by by a house, but they are real co consumer goods that are backing them. So there's, uh, in this sense, uh, it's. Um, Giving up, giving up the consumption of these consumer goods. Yeah, the, they say the the entrepreneur could consume this consumer good, and uh, therefore it's backed by real savings, and therefore it's unproblematic. Okay, so just to, and forgive me for drilling down on this, but since we're doing a whole episode on this topic, it's <laughs> we might as well really get into it. So even it sounds like a, even my earlier distinction isn't quite the the dividing line. So it's not whether. There's collateral or not, because you're saying even a mortgage, which in a sense, you know, there's the physical house that's sitting there that's backing it up. You're saying that would not, a, a, a mortgage that a commercial bank grants on a house, you're saying that would not fall under the umbrella of the real bills doctrine. No. Okay. Be because it's uh, also self-liquidating. So it's it's a real bill, a commercial paper issued uh, <clears throat> to transport, for example, the consumer goods to the market. Mm -hmm. And then after three months uh, or 90 days or 30 days, then um, when the consumer goods are sold, then the rebuild is paid down and it's self-liquidating in the sense that then the new money that has been produced, the fiduciary media that has been produced, disappear again. So the, the money supply actually fluctuates in this theory according to what you said, also the needs of commerce or the needs of trade. If mm -hmm. more consumer goods come to the market and have to be transported, yeah, then the amount uh, to, to, uh, to, to buy these goods increases. So you, mm -hmm. we need more money to sell them at the same prices. And therefore the banking system comes in and produces more money. And afterwards, uh, when, when it's paid, uh, when, when they are paid the consumer goods, then the money supply shrinks shrinks again. So according to the needs of trade and the volume of the consumer goods produced, the money supply adjusts and therefore the price level remains the same. Okay, yeah, okay. So yeah, I can see why in their view, this isn't distortionary. There's nothing artificial about it that, yeah, the, the money supply, it's like an accordion, it expands, but only when there's the demand for it. And then like you say, it gets paid back and disappears. So it's not like the money supply is permanently higher and so you you know it's not going to have this effect on prices, and also because there's the demand there for it, it's it's not like it's going to just be burning a hole in people's pockets, as they say. So it's not like a helicopter drop, the way a Ben Bernanke would talk about. So it's not going to just drive up spending across the board. So okay, I think we've got a good understanding of that. And so now, what? How, how should we proceed in terms of the listener getting the big picture of what you do in your book? Should we first explain why Rollo? how he attacked Mises, or is it just worthwhile you just now explaining right away what's wrong with the real Bell's doctrine? <laughs> well, um, there are, let's talk about why it's wrong. I mean, there, okay. there are many, many critiques of it. Um, one, I mean, the real Bill's doctrine is very old. It's, it came before Fekete and, and Rayo. So, um, one thing that has always been criticized is, of course, that it links the money supply to a nominal value, which is the value 
of the consumer goods brought to the market. Yeah. The value of the consumer goods brought to the market is, however, not independent of the money supply. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> the higher the prices of the consumer goods, the, uh, the higher the discount that entrepreneurs can, can receive for discounting or how the higher the money, the amount of money that entrepreneurs can receive for discounting the consumer goods. But if they receive more money, prices of consumer goods will increase. So then they can discount even higher uh, totals of commercial paper, of real bills, and so on. So it's a it's a upward spiral, so to speak, um, because uh, new money is produced, then the the price of consumer goods rise, and therefore even more money can be produced. Okay, um, let me just stop you right there. So just to give a specific example. So you're saying a defender of that view might have supposed. Uh, no, it's, it's not like the banks are creating something artificial that if the, if the business steps forward and wants to borrow $10,000 and they're pledging, you know, $10,000 worth of inventory, you know, that, that's, that's genuine backing of that. But your point is the, the reason that that inventory might have a current market value of $10,000 is partly dependent on the fact that the commercial banking system is fractional reserve and that there's more money at any given time than there otherwise would be under 100% reserves. So it's yeah, so it's not exactly. right to look at that and just say, oh, there's $10,000 worth of inventory, and that's independent of the banking system, that that's not a true statement. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, the, but the, the, the main problem is, of course, as you all also have pointed out, that it doesn't imply an increase in, in real savings, even though they say so. I mean, Sajan also says so. Sajan even says it for the... For the for any credit expansion, mm -hmm. um, that if people hold on to this fractional uh, to these notes created by the banking system, this would be increase in savings. And Ryu says the same. Well, Ryu says, in the case of real bills, if people accept the fiduciary media, that is the unbacked monetary substitutes that are created by discounting, yeah, by when when banks buy. By these commercial papers, normally called discounting. Yeah? So if they buy with new money, with new fiduciary media, this discounting, <clears throat> then uh, Rayo says, as someone is holding these, um, he calls it financial assets. Yeah, And therefore, anyone who holds a financial asset, for example, anyone who holds a stock yeah, is actually a saver. So anyone who holds actually a fiduciary media issued by a bank, yeah, a liability by a bank, yeah, is actually a saver. And therefore, it would be, uh, yeah, th there would be no lack of real savings. However, the error here is that um, fiduciary media are not financial assets. They are, they are money. Yeah? They are perfect monetary substitutes and they can be used to increase consumption. They form part of the cash balance. Yeah, the, the, the fact that they are considered to be perfect monetary substitutes implies that people don't make a difference between holding a banknote and holding cash. Yeah. So um, the cash balance increases when there when the banks discount fiduciary discount real bills, and therefore um, people can consume more. And uh, the uh, this may lead then to to uh, or if if the banks uh, uh, produce this fiduciary media and the company uses it for new investment projects, yeah, no one has saved more. Yeah, the it's just new money substitutes, perfect money substitutes has been created, but there has been no real savings because because savings is a flow; it's not a stock. Yeah, this is a, the big uh, problem or error of fractional reserve banker. Savings is not a stock. Yeah, saying that ah, if 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 more fiduciary media are produced, then the stock of savings. Yeah, people have more savings because they have a higher <laughs> higher mm -hmm. amount in their bank account. Yeah, the stock variable of their savings, uh, if you want to call it savings, has increased, or the cash holdings have increased, but the flow of savings is essential. The flow of savings is the amount of consumer goods 
that are not consumed, yeah, the goods produced that are not consumed and that are become available to sustain the factors of production um, in the investment projects. Yeah, to sustain these workers and so on, the new projects you need consumer goods. Yeah, uh, that are that are not consumed but saved. Yeah, and and uh, given to these workers to these factors of production. So, so the uh, the flow, the flow of savings do not increase by discounting real bills. Yeah, there are not more real savings around. Yeah, and uh, what is uh, relevant to this point also is that you can spend your money on three margins, as Rothbard says. Yeah, you can spend your money income on consumption, you can spend it on investment, or you can use it to increase your cash balance. Now, what is relevant for the question of how long, how long can the structure of production be? How many investment projects are viable? is the relation between the consumption and the investment spending. Yeah, this is determined by time preference. Is the time preference low or false? Then people spend less on consumption and more on investment. Yeah, and investment good prices rise relatively to consumer good prices, indicating that people are uh, willing to wait, uh, to wait longer. Uh, and if it's the other way around, if people start to consume more and invest less in time, per, it's an expression of the time press preference has risen and only shorter projects become viable. Now, if we have these two variables, um, consumption and investment spending, they may um, behave independently, independently of what the spending on cash balances is or behaves. So if the demand for money increases in the sense that people want to hold higher cash balances, yeah, uh, Rayo and the real bills people would say, well, the demand for money has increased and therefore uh, we can increase the supply of money. Yeah. <clears throat> and there can be more and there's more savings. Yeah. People are willing to hold more fiduciary media. There are more savings around and therefore there can be more investments. But that's not true. Because people can increase the demand for cash balances uh, without a change in time preference. Because the, cha the time preference is the relation between the consumer and investment spending. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I can increase my cash balance if I, uh, instead of saving, paying into my savings plan every, every month uh, $100, this month, I only pay in $50. So my cash balance has increased, right? Uh, $50, my cash balance has increased. My demand for money has increased. But what has happened to my time preference? My time preference has, has increased yeah, because I spent relatively more on consumer goods. Yeah, My consumer goods spending hasn't changed and I spent more or uh, less on investment goods. Yeah, it has fallen from from one hundred to fifty. So, uh, if the fractional reserve banking system in interprets this higher demand for money that now more investment is uh, are possible, it's and there can be credit expansion finan financing new investment projects. They are obviously mistaken because time preference has increased. So. Um, I think the, this uh, distinction between the three margins where you can spend your income, and this is indicating how many how many um, savings are available for investment pro projects is is crucial, and is not understood by real bill defenders. Okay, a lot there. Let me try to unpack some some of those threads. Okay, so one thing is just kind of fundamentally. It, uh, let me s state this, and then you tell me if if you agree or if you if you disagree. If a business um, they're producing a, a flow of television sets, let's say, and uh, they they produce a certain amount uh, and they sell them off for revenue, and then the but a, a portion goes into inventory. They put it in the warehouse. I'm okay saying like over the course of that month, if if 200 extra television sets were added to inventory that you could say the business saved that, right? Is that, are you okay with that? 
So that accumulation of consumer goods is a flow of savings. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're saying, though, is, okay, so if that's what the savings is, fine. And so, yes, that accumulation of, of 200 extra television sets you know, is an accumulation of, of consumer plain, you know, it's plain saving, I think the way Mises talked about it. Okay, but then if that business then goes to a commercial bank and the commercial bank creates a bunch of new money to lend to the business, you can't then also point to that new money creation and say, oh, that's that's corresponding to the savings of the 200 television sets because no, we already counted that. It'd be like double counting. Like the same act of, of genuine saving that led to the expansion of inventory in a quote real sense can't then also be the act of saving that they're or the, fl the flow of savings over a period of time that they're then using to justify the bank expanding the money supply is, is, is do you follow what i'm saying is that was that yeah, part exactly. of what your it, critique it, is okay it would be double counting yeah because s s someone is already saving for this uh, production process to be mm -hmm. completed and it's only completed, by the way, when the product is sold to to consumers. So um, the last three months, like the transportation, is just one stage of the production process. In this sense, they are not finished consumer goods because they are not finished to be consumed. It, they are still three months missing. And you mm. need savings for all these three months. So if you now create new money by dis discounting, commercial bills to finance the transportation, um, there have not been sufficient savings around. You need it for until the very end. And then the company, let's assume the company has been financing the production process to the very end through equity all the time. Yeah? And now comes a fractional reserve banks and just uh, discounts uh, uh, a real bill of the company and now the, the company has new new money what will it do with it now it has freed equity right yeah the equity mm -hmm. that before that was real savings that was used to bring the consumer goods to to the consumers to the stores now is freed up and can be invested and where will it be invested where the highest uh, profitability is expected and these are normally long-term projects. So, so it's also an error of the real bills defenders to think, ah, okay, uh, we look at the quality of the, of, of the uh, credits and uh, there will be only very short-term, very liquid um, investments financed by it. No, if you, as Rothbard also says, if you inject new money into the system, it doesn't, it's not so important where you inject it. It will finally find its way into longer term projects leading to uh, to distortions. Mm -hmm. Okay, L let me forgive me, Philip. Let me go on a little bit of a of a tangent, perhaps. But I think I'm just trying to sort it in my head and to, and to get across to the listener what the distinction is and why the real bills doctrine people are making a mistake. And I, so I think we can play with this example. So just forgive me, because partly I think the problem, Philip, is somebody who is who doesn't have a a, a background in the Austrian, or particularly like a, a Mises Rothbard view of banking, and to understand what the hundred percent reserve position is, I think they believe that banking per se has to involve fractional reserves, otherwise you can't do it, and and they interpret you to be saying banks can't be credit intermediaries. So let me just try to show people that that's. That's not what Mises or Rothbard or Philip Bagus is saying. And so you can imagine a 100% reserve situation. And so yet you've got your, your business, they've got a bunch of TVs in the warehouse, and it's going to take, let's say, three months to transport. You know, they got to they gotta put the TVs on trucks. They got to pay for the, the fuel in the trucks. They got to pay the drivers to drive the trucks to the retail outlets they got to pay employees to unload the trucks, to put the TVs on the shelves. And then over the course of three months, those 200 TVs will all get sold to the final consumer. You got to pay for the electricity in the buildings, you know, to, to air conditioning or whatever it is. The, the cashiers have to work, the register when the people. So there's a lot of expenses the business has to incur from the, you know, to get those 200 TVs that are in the warehouse 
into the homes of the consumers and have the money sitting in their cash register. And so that's why the business might approach a commercial bank and say, hey, we'd like to borrow some money for three months. Uh, you know, here's our commercial paper that, that explains the terms of the, of the loan and so forth. And we're pledging these TVs ultimately as the collateral. If we don't pay you back for some, if our, we go bankrupt or whatever, you can come and seize the TVs and, you know, okay. And so under a 100% reserve system, that can still work. And what happens is there are other people in the community who get paid, you know, they earn their income. They could go out and buy gasoline. They could go out and buy food and, and consume it. They choose not to. They save it. They give it to the, they give the money to the bank and they buy like a, a three-month CD, certificate of deposit. And so that's not in their checking account. They, they've renounced possession of the money. They, they use their money to buy a bond essentially from the bank. Then the bank takes that money and lends it to the business. And so if you think about it, what's happened in real terms is the gasoline and the food and so forth that those households could have consumed over that three months, they're not consuming and instead, the guy driving the truck and the cashiers working in the store, they're eating the food and using the gasoline or the diesel or whatever that those households could have if they had chosen to consume their full income. And so it's just kind of rearranging the consumption patterns. And so, but there, I mean, I'm just trying to drive home. The, and so that's all consistent with 100% reserve banking. So Rothbard and Vegas are okay with banks acting as credit intermediaries. It's just not through checking accounts. It's through genuine either savings accounts or, you know, buying bank CDs or whatever, other sorts of instruments. And so there, the saving that facilitates that bit, that three month bit loan to the business, it's not the 200 TVs, it's the uh, lower than, the, the lower consumption than the income would have allowed for among the households that gave, that bought the CDs from the banks. So the point is, instead of that, if instead the commercial banks gives the loan to the business and no household lived below its means. And where'd that money come from? Oh, the bank just created it through a bookkeeping entry. And, and so like the, the total amount of money increased in the community. And that's where the loan came from. So you can see the businesses extra, the consumption, you know, from the, the guy using the diesel to get the TVs to the store and all the employees who are just getting their normal wages and they're going out and buying food and whatever they do with their, with their wages that work for that business in the three month period. Their, their consumption is now coming at the expense of, we don't know what, you know what I mean? It, it's not that it's counterbalanced by genuine abstinence on the part of households, and that's how it all fits together. And so anyway, I'll stop there, but are you, are you tracking with the, way, with the distinction I'm trying to make there to show the savings to finance the short-term business loan if, if it's not coming from the house? It's, it can't be the collateral. That's like otherwise, if the collateral right. were the savings, then the business wouldn't need to borrow the loan in the first place. They already have it. So clearly- right. The right. collateral that you pledge to get a loan can't also be the savings that justifies the creation of the loan. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, the book is not really for beginners Yeah, be because it assumes already a lot of knowledge <laughs> in capital theory, in Austin business cycle theory. So, so, so what you are saying is that the the key point of the Austin business cycle theory is that you need, of capital theories, that you need real savings to make uh, a successful investment project. You have you have to have consumer goods to sustain the workers during the production process, as you say. So you need gasoline for the workers; they want to eat. Yeah. Um, so someone has to save. Yeah, and give up consumer goods, the gasoline, as you said, the food, and give it to the truck truck drivers. So you need real savings up to the very end of the production process. And now comes the problem. If you if you create new money without new savings, yeah, and this is the case of the real bills in in this example that the company pledges the TV sets and gets uh, not money that someone else has sa saved and has given up, but just money that the bank, the fraction of the bank crank, uh, creates a new, which is unbacked by real savings, yeah, fiduciary media. Then we have a distortion between the amount of savings and the investments, because now the TV company has uh, new money freed up 
which it can now invest in a new project, but there has been no real savings to sustain it. Yeah, and there the problems come in. And as you said, it would be double double counting to say that the TV sets would be would be savings. Yeah, someone <clears throat> already has saved saved for them and must save until the very end. If you say no, this is additional savings. No, um, I mean they can, and they cannot be consumed by any means. Mm -hmm. It's it's not true that the TV producer would put two hundred TVs in his house and co and be able to consume them. No, they are not. They are not consumer right. goods. Or uh, they, they only consumer goods when they are, uh, they are in the store and being, being sold. To count them as consumer goods and uh, savings would be double counting. Yeah, yeah. So great. I, I think we're probably, I, I hope, conveying to the listener who's, who's new to this stuff as to what's going on there. And that's probably also showing the, the importance of the Austrian school's focus on the heterogeneity of, of capital that if you if you just convert everything to money prices then oh yeah the savings of the TVs is kind of the same thing as whether it, the gallons of gasoline or diesel fuel and and the the food that the workers eat and the electricity that they use but obviously in the real world no it the form of the wealth matters as well so it's not just enough to say a dollar amount worth of saved consumer goods it matters. Like you say, the, the worker, you can't just pay them in TVs. And so that's, uh, you know, w whereas if, it, if, it, if everything were just like in a simple neoclassical model of how much of the capital stock is there at time T, then it could make sense that you could draw down on that and give the workers a little bit of the capital to, to hold them over until the final sale. But in reality, you can't if, if you know, you're know you talking about physical concrete capital goods. Yeah, exactly. And, and what you also said about the availability is very important because with the 100% reserve banking system, yeah, I, if, if I buy a real bill and we did not, we don't not even need a bank. So I can buy a real bill from an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I give, I give up the availability of the money. Yeah, so I cannot consume it anymore mm -hmm. because now, now I have the real bill or the stock or the bond or whatever financial asset I buy. And the purchasing power is transferred to the entrepreneur. But the problem with the, is when fractional reserve banking comes in, because in this case, no one is giving up purchasing power, mm -hmm. but the bank just creates a new book entry, yeah, uh, on its liability side. Saying, well, we, we credit the account of the entrepreneur with, with new money, but I haven't given up any money, nor any, or the purchasing power, nor anyone else else has given up purchasing power. So then we have the problem of this, uh, double, double availability. The two persons think that they have available and with, with good reasons they can use, make use of the money. That's great. Again, forgive me, Philip, but this is a, a deep thing. You've written a book on it. You're a PhD expert on this stuff, but let me just drive this home for the for the audience because the way you just said it, I think it's great just to illustrate what you are saying and what you're not. I think some of the people who are enthralled with like the writings of Selgin and White and the free banking stuff, I think they just really like banking. Like, oh, that's credit intermediation. That's great. And that you can match up uh, savers and borrowers and th that makes everybody gain in utility. And, and that's true. So we're, you know, the Austrians, Rothbard, Mises, Philip are not against banking per se. It's just a particular form. And so the, the, what you just said there, Philip, it's okay. There's nothing anti Misesian or Rothbardian. If a business wants to issue commercial paper that yeah, we got the 200 TVs in the, in the warehouse, our finance, our, our cash flows poor right now. We can't, pay the trucker company and the and the, the people working at the cashier and the the stock boys at the at the retail store in order to get these 200 TVs into the homes of the final customer we just we just we ran out of cash ah what do we do but we're we're solvent it's a good business model we just we have a cash crunch so yeah you're allowed they could even in principle like you say issue commercial paper to just individual households like some wealthy guy could just come up and say i, I have $10,000 right now I'll lend this to you for three months at this interest rate. Okay, that's that's totally fine. And the business can do that. And if it makes sense, great. But your point was the household, the guy to lend the 10,000 means that's 10,000 of consumption he could have enjoyed 
that now he can't until that loan gets paid back. It's not that the guy goes into his basement and prints up ten thousand in dollars or euros and gives it to the person. And and you can and the, I hope the people appreciate at home. If if someone were allowed to do that, if a guy could just pr- go to his basement and on his printer print up euros and go lend the business that, and then it would allow the business to pay its workers, you would realize, wait a minute, something doesn't click here. The 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 diesel fuel and the food going to the workers for that three months must be coming from somewhere. Someone else in the system must be consuming less for this to all fit. And the fact that a guy just printed up notes in his basement clearly isn't creating more diesel fuel. So I think you know, we're, we're hitting at the essence of, and, and so in principle then, whether it's banks that do it or a guy in his basement with his printer, it's the same economic uh, issue at stake there. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, I guess one of the problems is that I see you sitting there and I think, okay, you know all this, so, but I should, <laughs> but, but I should think about uh, the audience that may not have all this background. So I'm sorry for that. No, that no, it's, you're not doing anything wrong. I'm just I'm elaborating on stuff that yeah, just to make sure people are getting the importance of what you're saying. Um, so maybe, well, I'll, I'll stop there. So do, what what else did do you want to explain? I mean, because obviously we just focus on a few little things. You have a whole book on this. Are there other major problems with Corallo's approach, or maybe can you speak to you know you you mentioned Fakit? Do you want to like mention just who he is and and why he's relevant in this topic? Yeah, forget this. And uh, he's dead now. He he died a few years back. He was an Hungarian or from origin. It says he's Hungarian, Hungarian, but he lived a long time in the United States. And he introduced or reintroduced the real bills doctrine. Yeah, saying he's basically saying what Rayo is saying, but he never wrote a book about it. And mm-hmm. Rayo actually wrote a book criticizing Mises, yeah, he criticized Mises' theory of credit and banking, criticizing Mises for being a currency school banker and not seeing the advantages of fractions of reserve banking and the and the banking school. So in this sense, uh, yeah, they are, yeah, it's the same theory. The only thing is that Fikete did not uh, write it down in such a way and did not criticize Mises. But there's mm-hmm. one other point, uh, yeah, which is uh, important, which is Rayo says, well, the problem of the business cycle is not credit expansion, because if credit expansion, again, is backed by or is based on real bills, yeah, yeah that that the uh, the bank doesn't buy a mortgage, but buy, buys a real bill, bill with new money, then it's not a problem. Um, he says that the problem of the business cycle is borrowing short, lending long. Mm-hmm. So if a bank uh, issues uh, the three months uh, CD, as you said, or, or a one, or th- five year bond, and uses the money to invest long term yeah, into a project that takes longer than the maturity yeah, of the of the five month five year bond, for instance, for instance invests in a mortgage that takes 30 years, uh, then we have a distortion. So uh, the important thing is to match, yeah, to match maturities, borrowing in the, sh- uh, to, in the same maturities, yeah. Um, so the bank should only be uh, borrow for one year and then lend uh, for one year term, yeah. And then maturities would be matched and then there would be no business cycle anymore. Yeah. And my critique is that maturity mismatching per se on a free market is not a problem because, I mean, for me, it's obvious you can easily renew or roll over the short-term loan mm-hmm. until, up to the maturity of the long-term investment that you have. So to make an, um, an example, let's say you have a you have an investment project, you, you calculate that it will take you one year and you ask me for a loan to finance it and I say, well, Bob, I give you only for three months. Then uh, Rai would say, well, it's maturity mismatching. After one month, <laughs> after three months, excuse me, after three months, Bob has to pay back, but his project has not finished. He cannot sell 
the product. The product will only be ready after one year. So he has to liquidate it and uh, he has to stop it. And uh, there will be losses. It has been malinvestment. Yeah. But obviously that's not necessarily the case because you can make uh, a forecast. You may say, well, if Philip wants his money back after three months, I have here my other friend, Peter. <laughs> he most likely will give me another three months loan. Yeah. And after half a year, then I will go to Joe. Yeah. And then afterwards to Hans or, and then for another three months. And then you have a, you have a, a have rolled over the loan for one year. And then your product is, is, is ready and you, you can pay back the loan. Yeah. So, so I think his theory is uh, completely wrong. Maturity mismatching in a free market is actually productivity enhancing or welfare enhancing because um, there's always short-term savings around that are rolled over. And if entrepreneurs um, es estimate correctly the amount of short-term loans available that will be renewed continuously, they may use them to do long-term investment projects that have a tendency to be have a higher productivity. Yeah, you do only do long-term long projects if they have a higher productivity. So thanks to this rollover and maturity mismatching, there can be, this is welfare enhancing. So the problem is, of course, when you overestimate the willingness of people to roll over short-term savings. Yeah. In fact, if time preference, social time preference remains the same, uh, short-term savings will be rolled over. Yeah, but maybe there's an increase in time preference and people will st stop or reduce their short-term savings. Yeah. And this, this estimation about the future availability, availability of short-term savings, uh, can be distorted, of course. For example, <laughs> if we say, well, there comes the government and tells you, well, Bob, uh, I will bail you out, even though you find, don't find someone to renew the short-term loan. So if uh, there's, uh, there, you have a privilege, a government privilege, you will be more aggressive with your maturity mismatching. Maybe you will say, well, I will do a two year project, yeah, or a 10 year project, uh, mm. trying to find someone to roll over. And if I don't, well, there's the government or it's the central bank who prints money, or that we live in a fractional reserve banking system where all the time new money is produced that makes it easier to find. So there may be, as I say, uh, excessive maturity mismatching in a market that is uh, distorted by by the government. But in the free market, I don't see that there should be any tendency by entrepreneurs to systematically over or underestimate the future availability of short-term savings. So I don't think the, the cause of the business cycle is maturity mismatching, but it's actually fraction of the reserve banking, yeah, where new fiduciary media are produced, new money is produced without an increase in real savings. Okay, great. M maybe we'll just dwell on that last topic there. So here we're, we're pivoting away somewhat from your, your book specifically, but I think this will be of, of great relevance to the listeners of the Human Action Podcast. Obviously, correct me if I misstate something here, Philip, but my understanding is uh, Walter Block and William Barnett w have written, and so that they don't like fractional reserve banking, but they were trying to say, oh, the, the, the problem with fractional reserve banking, it's not merely people put money in their checking account and they think that that's there, and then the bank lends some of that out to, you know, 90% or whatever it is if the reserve ratio is 10%, lend it out to other people. And they, and Block and Barnett argued that's just one specific example. The general problem is maturity mismatching. And so there it's in the extreme where the checking accounts maturity is, is zero. Like it's, you know, it's supposed to be a, a demand deposit. Um, and so that that's to them, the issue is, yeah, when the banks borrow short and lend long. So if you take some people's money from a checking account and use it to fund mortgage creation, Rothbard, Bagus, Dave Howden, Walter Block, William Barnett all agree that's wrong, but Walter Block and William Barnett say, even if the bank, I'm just continuing with your example, takes in money from people buying three-month CDs, 
and then uses that to fund mortgages that are 30 year mortgages. Block and Barnett also think that's wrong. And for the same general reason, at least in terms of the economics, like the distortion, but you and Howden have written critiquing them and you're saying, we all agree fractured reserve banking is wrong, but no, maturity mismatching is just an entrepreneurial thing. And yeah, maybe if you do it poorly, you go out of business, but hey, you know, businesses can make mistakes all the time. That's not a violation of property rights or, you know, that's not going to cause a, a, a systemic boom bust. So well, let me just stop there. Have I correctly mapped out the different views people have in this space? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, oh, let me only add that Rayo has uh, a similar opinion to Block and Burnett, yeah, because mm -hmm. he 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 also thinks that maturity mismatching is is uh, the the real cause of the business cycle. Yeah, the difference is, of course, that <laughs> Block and Burnett think that all fraction fraction reserve banking is always a problem, mm -hmm. while Rayo says, well, it's not a problem if it's based on, on real bills, uh, because right, then right. someone is saving there. Yeah. Okay, so let's just for the moment focus, because the Rayo position doesn't make any sense to me, so let's put that <laughs> aside. But where, whereas I understand what you and Howden are saying, and I understand what Block and Barnett are saying, and actually, I'm not just being coy. I really am not sure how I feel. I, you know, I, I read your guys, your exchanges back and forth in the journals, and every time I would read the latest salvo, I would say, oh yeah, they make a good point. And then I would read the response. Oh yeah, they make a good, so it, it's a, it's a tricky issue. So let me just be provocative and, you know, put it to you this way, Philip, you know, you realizing I'm just doing this just to be provocative. Your defense of um, borrowing short and lending long on the part of the commercial banks and just say, well, they could just, you know, they got a forecast and they could just roll over those three month CDs to, to fund the 30 year mortgage. And as long as, isn't that what Selgin and White say about checking accounts? That, yeah, somebody could come in and go to the ATM and take their money out. And as long as the commercial bank correctly forecasts how many people are going to want to do withdrawals from their checking account, and the banks always keep enough in the reserves and the vault to satisfy those demand deposit requests, what's the big issue? And yeah, they might make a mistake. There might be a bank run, but that's just a forecasting error. And it's not some systematic problem. And we just leave it to entrepreneurship. And so what... Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I could see them agreeing with you vis-a-vis -vis Block and Barnett and just saying, Philip and Dave Howden don't take it far enough. Instead of, you know, the, the extreme version of borrowing short and lending long is to have checking accounts and use the, the deposits and those to go fund mortgages. Yeah, I mean, there are crucial differences. Um, by borrowing short, lending long, no new money is created. Yeah, By credit expansion, new money is created. Yeah. Um, so this is fundamental difference. And then, okay. yeah. and then with the process of, uh, the bank multiplier out of, uh, initial creation, um, they can be, uh, as you said, if the reserve ratio is 10%, the money supply may, may multiply by 10 if there are no, no frictions. Yeah. And th the other difference is when it comes now, this is the monetary part, when it comes to the capital theory part or savings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, is some, there is a real saver in the case of borrowing short, lending long. Yeah, If I borrow, uh, lend money for you to three months, I'm saving. Yeah, My position after three months is taken by another guy, but mm -hmm. there's still a saver. But with credit expansion, when the bank just prints new money or creates a new book entry, there is no one, no one saving. Yeah. And that leads, leads us to a third difference, which is, it's totally legitimate that I lend you three mon uh, money for three months and you invest it for long term. The only thing that you have to do is give it back to me after, after three months. I have given up the availability of the money for three months, yeah? Mm -hmm. I have given up the purchasing power for three months. So, and you have to give it back. But in the case of credit expansion, yeah, if I, I deposited money with you, I have money in my demand deposit account or with a bank and the bank then creates new money, I have not given up the availability of this purchasing power, of this money, and the bank transfers it and gives it to someone else. Yeah, by creating money, perfect monetary substitutes. So, uh, so this is my opinion is uh, illegit. Yeah, 
Yeah. So yeah. there are three three main differences actually. One is the what happens with the money supply. The other is about real savings, and the third is the ethical issue. Okay, great. And they all tie together. That the reason there is the ethical issue is, is because. So yeah, let me just paraphrase what you said, and we'll we'll close on this. And so, folks, the the critical thing here is when you take a hundred dollar bill or a hundred dollar euro note and you go to your commercial bank and you hand it over and you say, I'm depositing this into my checking account. And then you see, you know, the electronic display goes up by a hundred. You don't think that you just engaged in savings. All you did was transform the, the, the form of your money balance that you had it in the form of currency and you trade it, you know, you transformed it into an addition to your checking account balance you can still spend that at a moment's notice. And so you haven't renounced your possession of present goods. Whereas if you give a hundred dollars or a hundred euros of a paper note, a currency to the bank and you buy a three month certificate of deposit, you can't take that CD and go down to the grocery store and buy food with it. You can go down to the grocery store, buy food and swipe your bank card and have that come right out of your checking account. Like the, the merchant thinks um, bank issued debt in the form of checking account balances trades at par with currency. It doesn't think that three month CDs trade at par with currency. The, the bank won't, or the grocery store won't accept that. And so that's the sense in which checking account balances are included in M1, for example, right? So economists recognize that, yes, commercial bank checking account demand deposits for, for in many Purpose, for many purposes are the same thing as money. And that's kind of the whole point. And so that's why if banks engage in credit expansion, that increases the quantity of money in the broader sense is the way it's translated in Mises' theory of money and credit. So, whereas again, you're saying, Philip, that doesn't happen with the maturity mismatching at longer durations that you, you can say what you will about that, but it's not that the bank by issuing three month CDs to take in a bunch of cash to then lend out in 30 year mortgages the total quantity of money in that system has not increased. Whereas when they do take in money into checking account balances and then lend a bunch of it out, the community, people in the community collectively think they're holding more cash balances than they were before. And so you're saying that's clearly a different type of thing. And that's what you think causes the business cycle, that it's the creation of new money that's not corresponding to, you know, increased mining from gold mines or something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's that's good. I I think I understand this stuff better now <laughs> that we had this conversation. So I hope uh, that wasn't too painful for you to hear me just stop you and, and repeat back what you said in longer sentences. No, no, no. So, I thank you, and I okay. I, ap I apologize for for not being able or not thinking so well in explaining it. Yeah, so I explained it too difficult, I guess, or or no, no, or, it, it, or presupposing too many things, assuming that to assuming too many things. Yeah. Oh, don't, no, don't worry. This is how I, this is my style. Whatever, whatever, it's not just you. Whenever there's a guest, I stop them and say, let me repeat that back to you just to make sure the listeners are getting it. Okay, folks. So if you want to read, the book is Full Reserve Banking Versus the Real Bills Doctrine. And the subtitle is A Critique of the Monetary Theory of J.R. Rallo by Philip Bogus. And it is available at the Mises Bookstore. And Philip, if people want to see more of you, uh, are you are you on Twitter? Where, where do people go if they want if, to find more about you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, at Philip Vargas, for instance. Uh, I have a website also. Yeah, just Google me. Okay, yep, we, and we will put links to that at the show notes page. All right, well, thank you, Philip, for writing the book and for taking your time here to explain it to us. Yeah, it was a great, great pleasure, Bob. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. And thanks, everybody. We know you're a very sophisticated, intelligent audience, and you soaked all that monetary and banking theory up. So we thank you for that, and we'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. <laughs>